So if we go, we go all the way back, all the way back, um, and I do this a lot when I, when I get an opportunity to minister, because I think if we go all the way back, we can, and I say this all the time, we can get a, a sense of God's character before sin, right? And, and if you want to know what God is really like, who God really is, look at, look at him before sin came into the world. Now, God didn't change. People changed when sin came into the world right? But we can see the relationship between man and God so clearly before sin. And it was such a beautiful thing. And it was one full of uh, intimacy. It was one full of a conversation. It was one full of purpose. And I've realized that, that uh, our identity, our identity is, is tied to our purpose. Okay? Like if you read in Genesis, uh, uh, Adam was called man in the Bible. He was called man until he received his purpose, and then he was called Adam. That's not a fluke, right? Think about, think about Abram and Sarai. They received purpose and promise from God, and all of a sudden they became Abraham and Sarah. God didn't just change the way he, you know, the, the, the vocabulary. He didn't just like Sarah and thought it was more beautiful than Sarai. There was a reason. Th- think New Testament. Think Saul when he became Paul. When did that happen? When he received purpose from God on the road to Damascus right? Our purpose is tied to our identity. And so if you're here this morning and you find yourself in this identity crisis or a part of that stage, or you're just, man, I don't know who I am in God. I have no idea. I just, I believe in him. I believe in him. I know he's real. I don't know. I I guess, yeah, he loves me. I hear that he loves me. I believe that. Sure. If you haven't walked in purpose, you probably really haven't tapped into your true identity. Those two are so tied together. But, and we see that in Genesis, but we see other things. We see that God would speak so clearly to man, so clearly. There was no confusion. Remove confusion. I think the first time, really, that you see confusion become a thing was with Moses. And this could be wrong. It might not be the first time, but this is the first time I, 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 I realized it. It was with Moses. And it wasn't even confusion as much as it was rebellion. Remember when, when God told Moses, you know what, you're going to go to Pharaoh. You're going to tell him to let my people go. Um, and, and, and Moses is like, well, stop right there. Right, let's let, hang on a second. Who am I? And then they go back and forth and have this, this conversation. And then finally, the Bible says that, that God's anger burden against Moses. And I've, I've even mentioned that before, right? Because I, I think we can truly see God's character in relation to man. And I want to I say something this morning. You and I, we are not equals to God. And there is a gospel out there that, that, that when we come into Christ, we become equals with Christ. We, become, we will never be equals with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We will be bought by the blood of the Lamb. We will be redeemed. We will be sanctified, right? We will be made right, reconciled to God, but we will never be equals with the King. We will never. And so because of that, his ways will always be higher than our ways. His thoughts will always be higher than our thoughts. Why are you saying that? Well, because it shows you and I that we have some searching to do. We have to, we, have to, we have to get to a place where we're hearing from God. If his ways are higher and his thoughts are higher and he's higher, we need to hear from what he has to say about our lives, right? Unless you want to continue just to make it from service to service. And I almost feel guilty for asking you, some of you to sign up for outreaches. Can I be honest? How can I expect any of you to, to, to go in and, and minister out of an overflow if you're barely making it yourself? And I have to look in the mirror with this word, okay? I'm not always in this overflow. Let me tell you, sometimes I have to, I'm, 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 what is that, uh, military crawl? That's how I feel like, like I'm not running this race like Paul. Sometimes I feel like I'm crawling. I'm like, God, this is not the way you intended for me to live. But I refuse to change the gospel to, to justify my problems, right? Like I'm preaching to me as I'm preaching to you this morning. But what I can tell you, and I'm so thankful, and it's not always clear and perfect, but I hear from God. I know when he's speaking to me, man. I know. I know when it's God. Because usually it's something I don't want to do. Usually it's something I don't want to say. But it always makes sense, and it aligns with the word. Do you know when God's speaking to you? Do you know it? Let me... How many believe that God is always speaking to you? He's always at least willing to, always has something he wants to say to you. How many can tell me at least five things he told you yesterday? Don't raise your hand. You don't have to raise your hand. Jesus said this. He said that I've only come, first he says, I've only done what the Father's told me to do or what I've seen the Father do. And then later in in, uh, in, uh, Matthew, he says, 
I've only said the things that he's commanded me to say. If you read in the book of the Mark, it says that, that you could not contain, there's not enough books that could contain all the things that Jesus did. That means God is always talking. He's always telling Jesus what to do and what to say and how to say it. And, and Jesus followed that so perfectly. A man without sin, it's, un, it's, it's unbelievable. But we have, to, we have to ask ourselves, why is it so difficult to hear? And we can throw out some, some kind of basic answer, sin. Yeah, sin is a separator from God. If you have active sin in your life and you know you have sin in your life and you refuse to deal with it, yeah, you're probably not going to hear from God so clearly because you're ignoring the word of God, right? And we can throw out some answers, but the, the Bible actually offers some really, imagine that, right? The Bible, the word of God actually offers some incredible insight on this very matter. Uh, let's go to James chapter three. Man, I'm gonna, I need to open up my notes. And we'll start in, uh, in verse 13. That's going to be the second half of the chapter. And we'll read till the end. I think it's verse 18. <coughs> and can we get that on the board? Listen, it starts out with this question. It says, who is wise and understanding among you? This is one of those questions you don't raise your hand to either. Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. And we'll pause right there. Uh, just, just real quick. It says that, that your, your works are done in the meekness of wisdom. The meekness of wisdom. What does that mean your works would be done in the meekness of wisdom? It means that when you work, when you do something, the evidence of that work, it, 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 it will be obvious that it was done in wisdom. Right? Knowledge is one thing. Wisdom is, is another thing. Wisdom is, is acting out the knowledge that you have. Right, my, my wife, she, she's sitting back there. She gets mad at me all the time because I, I have a lot of knowledge on eating right. I just don't eat right, right? Like I legitimately have so much information on fasting, intermittent fasting, um, um, you know, Atkins, all these different types of diet, Whole30, all of this information, things about what happens in your body when you put too much grain in it, things, all of this information. But guess what? I'm overweight, right? Let's be honest. I'm overweight. So who cares about the knowledge that I have? right? There's a scripture in the Bible that says wisdom will be proved right by all of her children, meaning when wisdom is present, there will be evidence of that wisdom. There will be evidence of that wisdom. Now, next week when I come in looking like a bodybuilder, <laughs> right, and I'm lifting 350, right? That's not. Maybe one day. But then you can look at me and say, man, that guy had some knowledge. I can see it. I can see that he knew something. But until that day comes, it's just knowledge. And so it says, go back one, 13. Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter and envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but it's earthly, sensual, demonic. Wow. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Pause. Hold the phones. Where, where envy and self-seeking exist, you have just opened the door to confusion and every evil thing. That's a big door. That is a huge door. And then we can look at it, and at first we think, man, yeah, that, that's... That's, wow, envy and self-seeking, God bless those people. But it's so easy to get caught up in either one of these. Let's hold off on envy for a moment. Let's just talk about self-seeking because we could spend the rest of the, the service talking about self-seeking and being a self-seeker. We know that we're supposed to seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness, but this is talking about seeking self first, right? What does that mean, self-seeking? It's pretty much what you think it would mean, having concern for one's own welfare and interests before those of others, or self-serving. We don't have to think globally on this, right? Let's just think in our homes. Hey, babe, what do you want for dinner? I, I don't know. What do you want? I don't know. What do you want, right? How many's been there? Back and forth, back and forth until somebody says an option. I don't want that. Right? I don't want that. 
give me three options and I'll pick one. And then you hate all three of them, right? Or whatever it is in the home. And then we argue about it and we argue about it. And, and, and all of a sudden we start self-seeking. And then guess what? You know what we do when we do that? Open the door for confusion and every evil thing. It's something as small as that, self-seeking. Whenever you're seeking your interest above somebody else's. Envious. You know, envy, I was, when, I was, when I first came across this, this, this set of scripture and God began to convict me about these, he convicted Aaron first. Listen, I, uh, I, I, I was like, well, envy, I don't think I'm envious. I don't think I, I've been envious, really. I kind of, and I read the definition, a feeling of discontent, uh, discontentment or a resentful um, uh, oh, a longing arousing by someone else's possessions, qualities, or luck. And I thought, well, I'm never, I don't really look at people's things and think, man, I'd really like to have that. Man, look at that car. I'd drive that sucker. Right? I don't, I don't have that mindset. I really don't. I'm not, things don't really drive me mo- or motivate me. But when I saw qualities, one's qualities, I thought, ooh, <laughs> maybe I am a little envious. I know for sure I used to be, and I was just telling uh, the worship team upstairs, I said, man, I, I came to the realization. I didn't know it then, but I was so envious of Josh Mendoza. This stud on the camera right here. I was so envious of Josh Mendoza. And it was because I saw him come in and do things that I was doing in the church, right? In, in terms of like media and things like that. And he did it a thousand times better. A thousand as I understand, uh, a million times better than I ever could do it. And I didn't realize it at the time. Hindsight's twenty twenty. I was so envious. And I was jealous. And I didn't, and I, and, and I don't know what I was thinking then, but I realized now the reason I could never do it as good as Josh Mendoza could do it is because I wouldn't put in the time to be as excellent as Josh Mendoza did. I watched him study and learn how to do things and take his time with things and make sure that it was great before he would put it out. I watched the, the way he went about it. And I never would put in that effort. I never would put in the time of day to be as great as something that, that Josh Mendoza, and I was so envious of him. But with envy, envious and, and wherever envy and self-seeking lie, confusion and every evil thing are there. Do you believe what the Bible says this morning? So if when you're praying and you're asking the Lord for direction and asking God to hear his voice, and all of a sudden it gets cloudy, Sometimes you end up a little bit more confused than you were. You have to look in the mirror. You have to do a self-check and say, God, am I self-seeking? In fact, you even praying about a matter might be an indicator that you're self-seeking. Let me explain. Now, I'm not saying you don't take your needs before the Lord. You do. That's what the Bible says. Cast your cares on him. He cares for you, right? Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. I'm not saying you don't cast your cares and you take your needs before the Lord. But what I'm saying is, are you praying for something that goes against the word of God? Are you praying for something that you don't find in the word? Are you ignoring a whole revelation that God has given you from the God? Like, for instance, um, uh, um, maybe you're a husband, okay? Maybe you're a husband and you're the head of the house, you're the priest of the home, and you are ignoring your duties as a priest. And while you're ignoring your duties of the priest, you're trying to add this to your life. You're trying to add this, this program or this thing or this activity or this whatever it is, and, and it's not happening the way you want to. And so you pray, God, you see my heart's desire. I really want to add this to my life. I really want to take part in this. I really want to do this. How could? And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I'm self-seeking. I'm self-seeking. I'm, I'm seeking what I want before what God wants, right? And I'm talking to the man who's had the revelation that, oh, you're supposed to be a priest of the home. God's speaking to you in these areas. I don't expect any of us to have a full understanding of the Bible at all times, okay? I don't. That's why sanctification is a progressive work, right? That's why we're, we are clay on a potter that continues to spin and be molded. That's why we continue to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. This is a progressive thing. I don't expect us to all get it at once. But when God reveals something to you, and he, he convicts you of it, and he speaks that to you, and you know he did, and you ignore it, and you try to, you're praying about something else over here, your prayer might just be an indicator of your self-seeking, Right? And guess what? We just kick that door wide open. 
confusion and every evil, not some evil things, by the way. You're dealing with evil in your home? Let's see if we can find envy and self-seeking there, right? Let's look for it. That might be it. That might be it. You have a hard time crucifying your flesh? You know, and let's, let's boil this down for a second. What is the opposite of envy? Right, like what's the opposite of being envious? Being, being grateful for what you have and wanting to bless somebody else, right? Instead of being envious of what they have and wanting it for yourself, you want to give to others. What is the opposite of being self-seeking? Seeking someone else's own interests before your own. Let's call that, I don't know if there was a word for that. Um, you know, let's just call it love. Let's just, let's just call it love. What is love? Patient, kind, right? We can go through the whole, we can go through that whole Corinthian right there, 13. And we can, we can say, oh yeah, that's, okay, it's never envy. Okay. If we love others, if we genuinely would have a heart to love other people, I believe that this is a non-issue. It's a non-issue because if you love someone else, you're not self-seeking. Loving is not self-seeking. If you love someone else, you're not going to be envious of what you have because you're, you love them. Right? I was, I was praying about, God, what do you want me to bring to this pulpit? Because um, in the beginning of the year, you know, really the word, the word, um, when, when pastor was praying, you know, God, what, 2022, you know, what are we dealing with? What is this? What's the theme or whatever? And, 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 and pastor said, or God said, really no theme. Stay the course. Steady as she goes, all hands on deck. Stay the course. But how can you and I stay the course if we don't recognize the course that we were on? All right, let's just keep it simple. If we can't recognize the course that we are on, how can we possibly stay it, right? What course were we on? Loving people and crucifying the flesh. But we want to run from that so quickly. And you want to know why? Because it starts to work. And then when it works, it gets hard. And I'm going to show you in Scripture. When it works, when you, when you love people and you crucify the flesh, there's no envy, there's no self-seeking, and you hear from the Lord, it gets difficult. Because a lot of times we don't like what we hear. Let's go to uh, let's go to Matthew chapter seven. In <clears throat> verse twenty four, it says this: "It says, therefore, whoever hears these, this is Jesus speaking. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man who built his house on the rock." And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and, and, and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. You know, um, that stinks, man. Like... You mean the one who hears Jesus' words and does them also has to go through the rain and the storm and the beating on the house? And that's when it works. We hear his voice. The confusion is gone. We crucified our flesh and we love people. And all of a sudden we're hearing his voice and we're obeying him. And those who hear his voice and does what it says is like the man who built his house on a rock. And when the wind comes and, and it beats against the house and you say, you know what? I quit. I can't stand it. I can't take it. I can't take it. I back out of that. I ba- I'm circling the mountain. I'm just going to keep going around. I'm going to keep in this wilderness. I can't take it. It's easier. It's almost easier. And then all of a sudden conviction comes, and then you, you barely make it to church. Right? When God's, a lot of times God speaks wonderful things to us that are edifying. I mean, every time he speaks, it's wonderful if we look at it with the right perspective. But sometimes it's just right off the bat. I remember I've said this so many times because it was a life changer and it was just a moment for me. I was driving a shuttle van for an old hotel I used to work for. And as I'm driving, just as clear as day, the power of God came into that van and said, I love you. And I pulled over and I wept. I almost crashed. I don't know if I needed it, but I needed it. I'm so thankful. (laughs) She said, yes, you do. I'm so thankful that I got it. Changed my life. Simple. 
I heard his voice and I didn't have to hear the. But guess what? There was a day when the rain came and the wind was beating on my house. And I, oh, yeah, Jesus, I remember you love me. I remember you love me. Right. And we were able to withstand that. We don't like we don't like a lot of what we hear because a lot of what we hear is nope. Nope. God, should I should I I don't know, guys. There's so many situations. Should I approach so and so about the, the offense that's inside of me? Nope. Yeah, but I really want to. Why do you really want to? So you can dig into them and tell them what they did to you? So you can tear them down at the expense of uh, at the hopes of you being built up? And God says, "No, don't do that." Let me heal that in you. Let me deal with that in you. And then we could talk about the other, right? But we don't want to hear the no. We want to hear the, yeah, go get them. Sick them, right? That's not how God works. And the thing is, and we know this, church, we know God will never change the way he does things for you. He will never change his character for you. He will never change his standard for you. He will never change the, the way the kingdom of heaven operates will not be changed for you. It just won't. And so you and I have an opportunity to hear his voice and make those alterations and those adjustments. I remember when pastor said that, stay the course. I thought, man, that's a great word. Like, like stay the course means we're on the right track, right? Like, stay the course means, like, we don't need to make a hard left. We're doing it right. And then I was like, well, no, because the course we were on were full of adjustments. And, and we, were, we were crucifying the flesh. The course that we were on was full of change. And we're supposed to stay on that course, right? And at first, it sounded so good. I was like, yeah, it was one of those words that we want to get. It's like, yeah. And then you realize what it really means. And you're like, oh. But how come, how come it's, oh, how come it's not, yeah. I can, cruise, I can finally get rid of this junk. I can finally deal, look in the mirror and deal with this issue. You know, we had a meeting um, uh, Friday night with the discipleship team leaders, so like, you know, teachers of discipleship classes, uh, my leaders uh, uh, that, that we had, you know, like Thomas, Stephanie with Celebrate Recovery, so on and so forth. And um, we had a meeting and it was so good. Um, and I had, I had like an agenda of what we were going to talk about and what we were going to do. And when God wants to do something, God does something. And, um, and it totally went in a different direction and, and people were weeping. And, 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 but you want to know what the theme of that meeting was? The problem's you. The problem is you. It's not me. Well, it's me. It's not you. Do me a favor. Look at your neighbor. Say, the problem's me. Now look at your other neighbor. Say, no, it's not. It's not you. It's me. Do you see what we just did there? You're the problem. In my marriage, when there's an issue, I'm the problem. In my conversations that I don't, if I don't get along, if I don't agree with somebody, whatever, uh, uh, peacefully, let me say peaceful, if peacefully, if I don't agree with somebody, the problem's me. It's not them. Because guess what? Even if they, even if they are at fault for something, I should still be a, uh, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, right? I should still be that, that place of refuge. I should be the peacemaker, the peacekeeper. I should be the one to instill the peace and make the change, change the atmosphere because I have Jesus within me, even if it's them, their fault. But the moment I don't do that and I play the game, it's my fault. It no longer matters because now I'm, I'm, I'm wrong in the situation and I'm wrong in the eyes of the Lord. Are you with me? And that became the theme of this meeting is the problem is you. And I kept saying this and Tom was like, hey, you know, and he told me this morning, he goes, I'm not your Holy Ghost, you know. And I said, I know. And he said, uh, but there's a sermon in that. It's you. He goes, you said it over and over. It's you. It's you. It's you. It's you. And, and it's because I have to look in the mirror every day and I have to say, it's you. It's you. It's you. It's you. And can we, can we just get on board that the problem's you? Yeah. And look at me. Everyone said, no, Aaron, the problem's you. No, it's not. It's you. You don't know what to do right now. <laughs> the problem's yourself and the problem's myself. The reason we can't hear from the Lord, it's my fault. Problem you don't hear from, it's your fault, right? But when we do hear from the Lord and it starts to work, this is where we just left off, when it starts to work and that, that, that rain comes and that storm comes and even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, right, when, we're, when, we're, when, when it's uncomfortable, when it's hard, we want to forfeit, we want to quit. 
And I want to ask you, can you stay? Can you stay long enough to allow God to do what he wants to do in that situation? Will you stop forfeiting God's blessing on your life? Think about this. The, 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 best thing, the, the best thing could happen in the worst situation. And I mean that. Think about, think about Jesus. Jesus went to the cross. What happened on that cross? The best thing for you and I, but also the best thing for the thief hanging on the side of him. Think about all the times Jesus said, it's not my time yet. My time has not yet come. My time has not yet come. I wonder if it's because he had more ministry to do or because he was waiting for that thief to be crucified. I wonder if God had that appointed. God saw that thief with the heart that would change like that, the heart that would believe in a Christ. And, and he waited. And then as soon as that man was arrested, he goes, all right, Jesus, it's your turn. I wonder. I mean, I don't know. I wonder if that was it. Because the best thing happened in the worst situation, and it's true for you and I, if we allow it, if we'll withstand the rain for a little bit longer, if we can just, just buckle in and remember the things that God says about us and who we are to him, and, and, and we, can, we can bundle in with Jesus and we can withstand the storm. I wonder what would happen. I know what would happen. The perfecting of the saints is what would happen. Let's go to Genesis chapter 12. <coughs> is this making sense so far? Amen. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your father and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. Now, now listen, God is speaking specific right now because that's how God speaks. God only speaks specifically. He only speaks in a clear way. Jesus would speak in parables, but it wasn't to confuse the disciples. It was so that they would understand what he's talking about. Jesus is a very, very uh, articulate fellow. <laughs> He knows what he says, what he means, and he means what he says. He's speaking clearly right now with clear instruction because that's how he always wants to speak. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions and that they had gathered and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they uh, came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of uh, Shechem as far as the, someone say that for me, Ter Terebinth tr uh, tree uh, of Morah, and the Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give the land. And there he built an altar to the Lord whom appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain of the east of Bethel. And he pinched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and he called on the name of the Lord. So Abram journeyed going on still toward the south. Let's keep going. Now there was a famine in the land. Uh-oh. And Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there for the famine was severe in the land. Let's pause right there. Everything was on point. Abram was doing so good. He got up, he left his descendants the way God told them. He took his things the way God told them and he went into the land which God had told them until there was a famine. Until there was a famine. And, and, and it says this, and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there for the famine was severe in the land. But I missed the part in 10.5 where God told him to do this. Right? Now we're talking about the father of faith. We're talking about Abraham, the man. Right? The one when God said to sacrifice your only son, uh, 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 he took him up there with a knife. Held it over, the very, the very seed of the promise of God, and he was going to do it. And then in Hebrews, we realize that Abraham believed that even if he did kill him, God would raise him back from the dead. We're talking about the man, Right? And God didn't tell him. He, he, there was, a, there was a, a famine in the land. And so Abram's like, you know what? And this is, we do this. You know what? I'm just going to go into Egypt. 
I'm just going to go and buy this house, or I'm just going to go move to the city, or I'm just going to go attend this church, or I'm just going to go take this job, or I'm just going to go do this career, or I'm just going to go marry this person, or I'm just going to go on and on and on. You know what? Why not? It's not comfortable here anymore. You know, and then, I, and then you know what response I got? I talked about this to somebody who I really respect. They don't attend this church. I talked about this, this issue. And you know what they said? Well, what about the four guys that, that, that they, were, they were dying in the, in, the, um, in the famine? They were like, well, if we stay here, we're going to die. If we go, we're going to die. We might as well go. And then they were blessed. They weren't covenant people. They, didn't, they don't play by covenant rules. They don't play by, I have to obey God. They don't even, they're, they're not Christians. They're not disciples. They're not Israelites. Right? When you and I come into a covenant, we play by different rules in the world. The world can act out of desperation. You and I should never be desperate. God will show mercy to the world. He will. But we shouldn't liken ourselves to them. We play by different rules. We have a different standard over our lives. You and I don't make giant decisions without consulting God if you're a disciple. And I'll say it again. If you're a disciple... You could play church. You can go to church. You can. If, 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 if being a Christian was a crime, going to church is not enough evidence to put you away. You know what I'm saying? It takes more than going to church to be a disciple. The way you walk with the Lord will determine whether or not you're a disciple. And you guess what happens? Guess what happens? And we'll read further. But remember, we're envy and self-seeking. And that's what happens. Self-seeking. He's in a, he, Abraham is in a, Abram at this point is in a, in, a, in a famine. And he starts to self-seek. Instead of looking at God who told him to be there, he starts to self-seek. What comes with self-seeking? Confusion and every evil thing. Let's see what happens. Let's go, let's go to the verse 11. And it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Pause right there. Already confusion's happening, because this is not what happens. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you that... Th oh, let's go to the next one. Please say you are my sister. Every evil thing. Here comes the lie. Please say that you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. Selfishness. So it was when Abram came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. The prince of, the Pharaoh, uh, the prince of Pharaoh also saw her and commanded, uh, commended her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. There's envy in there, too. He treated Abram well for her sake. And he had uh, sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with the great plagues. Because now, Okay, let me finish this real quick. I'm gonna, but the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. Pause right there. In the New Testament, we don't talk a lot about God plaguing things. Right, because his mercy is new, his grace is sufficient, um, and that's absolutely true. But do we see God's character? Do we see the way God feels about things? The way God responds to sin and disobedience and ignorance? Do we see that? That's all I'm asking. Do you see it? Let's go to 18. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now, therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go away. The confusion was there. He thought it was going to be one way, and it was a whole different way. Right? Because where envy and self-seeking is, confusion and every, every, evil kind, every kind of evil is there as well. But, but here he is in the famine. And he didn't get there by, by, by guesswork. He didn't get to the famine by making wrong choices. You know how he got to this famine? By hearing God clearly. Man, there's a good word for you. <laughs> That'll make you feel good, right? He got to the famine by hearing God clearly. But it's in these famine, it's in, it's in these, these droughts, 
It's in these storms. It's in these battles. It's in these, these, these really these, these situations that I'm going to call opportunities, okay, that, that allows you to really establish the kingdom of heaven in your home. And, and let me say this. You and I, we really don't have to play by the famine's rules either. When there's a famine, what is a famine? What really is that? What is a drought? A drought is when, when a, a region is lacking water, which is causing things to die, right? That's what a drought is. When we've been in a drought in California for a long time, or we have been or whatever, we were la- and farmers were kind of like, dude, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. We need water, right? And that's what happens. And, but you and I, when we, when we go through a drought, the Bible teaches that we can produce fruit in every kind of season. Because that's the Jesus we serve. God doesn't lead us into a famine and, and, and then abandon you. He leads you into a famine and gives you his word even more clearly on what to do and how to produce fruit in that famine. Maybe he leads you into a famine because you're supposed to be the water supply. Right? Maybe, he le- maybe you and your home, and, and I know, listen, this isn't guessing. This is not guessing. There are, there are houses that are, that, that are represented here today who are in a drought, who are in a famine, and, and, the, and, and inside their home, it's hell on earth. I'm not guessing this. And, and a lot of that has nothing to do with because God led you there. God didn't lead you into your ignorance into your self-pity within your marriage. God didn't lead you into this pride complex. I had to look in the mirror, guys. I'm not pointing fingers today. I'm telling you what the Spirit has revealed to me. I'm going to be serious for a moment because I believe that today God will change all of that. I believe that today he will start to send a rain in your home, one that you have been longing for. And, and he will wash that confusion away. He will wash that envy and that, that, that all those evil things that come with, with self-seeking. But you have to make up in your mind and your heart that you are not going to seek, seek your, seek, self-seek anymore. Husbands, seek the best for your wives. Wives, seek the best for your husband. Who cares if you don't see eye to eye? Who cares if you don't agree on a topic? Put the other one first. Your argument should be, no, you have your way. No, you have your way. No, you have your way. I have to look in the mirror. The way you parent your children. The way you go about with your conversation, conversating with your coworkers. I get it. Life has not been good in the home. How can we talk about this big body vision if our individual homes are a mess? You know who this reminds me of? Aiken. Right? Let's just dig a hole in our home and pretend like it's not there. And we're going to shove all of the the garbage that we're dealing with. And we're going to go to church and act like we're a part of this move of God. And God's saying, wait a second. Let's lift up that. (laughs) What do you got in there? Because if they're self-seeking and and envy, every evil thing is in there. Every evil thing that you're dealing with could be rooted back to that. Does that make sense? So maybe you got there because you heard the word of the Lord clearly, and he took you into a place that was uncomfortable. And instead of allowing God to, to, to deal with that, to deal with you in that, to develop a character that can withstand a storm, I mean, wouldn't that be the goal, to be like a Paul who, even if you're imprisoned and you're beaten, you're singing praises to God because it doesn't matter because your life is not here on earth. It's really in heaven. Your home is not here on earth. You're a foreigner in this land. And so not that you want to be in prison, but even if you are, guess what? It doesn't matter because this world didn't give it to me. This world can't take it away. Like these things we talk about and, and, and sing about, wouldn't it be great to actually walk them out? I think it would be wonderful. I told the, the, I told the, the people in the meeting 
uh, Friday, I said, man, I'm a mess. I'm not the mess I was last month. I'm definitely not the mess I was a year ago, 10 years ago. But tomorrow, later today, next year, I want to be a different kind of mess, one that's a little bit more sanctified. Right? And I know I'm not the only one. Lee, if you'd come to the... I think that's my daughter. Oh, hey, nobody touch her, by the way. She's new. <laughs> Can I say that? We all thank it when we have kids, right? But I get a mic, and I can just be like, hey, just, just give us some space, okay? She'll be here for a long time. We're not going anywhere. Unless you sneeze like Purell or whatever. Like, no, I appreciate you guys, and it's a pleasure to be a part of this house. Um, but if you stand to your feet, <clears throat> I pray that this made sense this morning. I pray that, that you can just look at your spouse or, or inside your home and be like, yeah, that makes sense. That's us. That's exactly what happened in our meeting Friday night. Yep, that's, that's us. Everybody, that's us. That's, that's us. Right? If that is the case, then, then let's not leave here and allow that. Let, let's make that change now. Just ask for forgiveness, confess your sins to the Father, allow him to forgive you, and then, and then guess what? If you need to make it right with your wife, your husband, with your kids, with your neighbors, whoever it is, make it right. Confess your sins to them. Confess what you did wrong, and don't go to them expecting them to apologize. It's irrelevant. It's irre less, guess what? If I have aught with my brother, my brother has no bearing on whether or not it rains in my house. My brother has no say on whether or not, and I'm talking about my brother in Christ, right? If me and Dave have an issue with one another and we got into it and, and I did him wrong or he did me wrong or whatever, at the end of the day, Dave has no bearing on whether or not God opens the windows of heaven in my, in my house. Every, I do. My decision making. It's up to me. But let's confess it. Let's just deal with it. And let's stay in that drought a little bit. Let's get, a, let's get one of those lawn chairs and just soak in the sun, right? S-O-N. Let's allow God to, to, to just lavish his love on us when we feel like we're, 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 we're deserted. Like that is such an opportunity. My son doesn't realize what an opportunity is when he's hurt or he's going through something or he's sick, what an opportunity that is for me as a dad or my wife as a mom to love on him. He doesn't understand when he's in pain what that means for me as a dad, right? We have this thing, my son and I, called boy time, boy, boy time, toy time. It used to just be boy time, and then somehow he weaseled toy time in there, and now we have to go buy him a toy when we have this time. Yeah, you laugh. $50 ice cream shop thing. Are you kidding me? But, uh, but anyway, I said that because, because we, we, we went to go have boy time, toy time, and he got out of the car, and I'll, I guess he gets this from my side of the family, but before he got out of the door, he somehow shut himself in the door, and he just, I, I don't even know how it's possible. And I, and I had to stop myself from laughing for it because I was like, dude, how did you? And then I realized, oh, he really hit his head. I need to check on him. But that was such an opportunity for the rest of the night for me to baby him and just to love on him and to, to lavish who I am as a father on him. And God does that in our droughts and he does that in our pain. I think as believers for so, we have so much wasted pain. So much wasted pain. Listen, you're gonna go through the drought either way. You're gonna go through the wilderness either way, right? Whether you rejoice in it or you're miserable in it. But if you rejoice in it and you, you check your attitude in it, then God is going to do something incredible in it. If, you, if, you just, if you're just one of those negative Nancys, if your name's Nancy, sorry, if you're just one of those people and you're just like, oh, I'm never going to do it. Forget it. You're going to be in the drought for another five years or you're going to circle that mountain and come back to it. Let's, let's advance this morning. Let's move forward this morning. Next week when we come to church, let's not barely make it. Yeah? If this word spoke to you, I want you to come forward and we're going to pray. <laughs> and I'm going to give you opportunity to kneel at the altars and to ask for forgiveness for the things you need to ask for forgiveness for. And we're going to take our time this morning. We're not in a rush. 
because I believe that God wants to speak clearly. That was another thing that, that God spoke over this year, right? Confirmation. Confirmation. I'll never forget it. You know where I get my number one confirmation when the Lord speaks to me? Through the Word of God, every time. That's where I go first. That's where be, God will reveal something to me, and I will immediately think of Scripture to back it up. Immediately. I'll, I'll go try to find it because I don't want That's where I get my first confirmation from. God wants to speak so clearly. Listen, if you're a spouse of, of a married person that's at the altar and you're like, well, it's a good thing they're there, you probably need to be here too. If life is not hell in your home and it's full of abundance and it is full of anointing and you are, you are walking this victory out and you are walking as a disciple should and you're staying in the, the drought, when the drought comes, it doesn't affect you. You affect the drought. You affect people in the drought. You bless them. You, 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 your fruit is abundant and people can eat of your fruit when they're lacking. If that's you, I want you to come behind the people and I want you to pray. And I believe people are, I believe, you know, you don't have to, if you're that person, come on. There's a lot less people. There's a lot less people coming on that call. Jesus, we thank you. Jesus, we, we thank you because your grace is sufficient and your mercy is new. We thank you because you are, uh, 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 you are faithful and you are just to forgive us of our sins, Lord that your blood does wash us white as snow. The deepest, darkest stain in our life, you will wash white as snow and cast it as far as the east is from the west. Lord, you are the, you are the restorer of the home. You are the restorer of relationships. You reconcile people to people, but God, you reconcile people to you. Your word says that no one could come to the Father unless the Spirit draws them. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask, I beg that you draw us this morning. Draw us this morning. God, lavish your, your mercy on us. Lord, it is your mercy that we need in these moments. It is your mercy that we need, God, when we're in error, when we're running from the drought. God, I pray for a tenacity to arise in your church. Lord, let a tenacity, a toughness, God. Let a toughness, God. Give us a strength that is not our own to arise in us so that way when you lead us into a drought, which you have, you did to Abraham, Lord. You allowed the, you led the disciples. You told them to get in the boat and go to the other side. And in the middle of that, they became into a storm. You do these things, God, because you want to perfect something in us. God, we will not slap your hand, Lord. We understand we are not equals to you. We are simply heirs. We were bought in with the spirit of adoption. We are sons and daughters. And God, we receive right now anything that you want to pour out on your people. Anything that you want to pour out on your people, Lord, we receive it. God, I pray that as we deal with envy and self-seeking, if that's you, if you're dealing with envy and self-seeking in any way, I want you to come forward. And, 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 and we, we repent of that, God. I repent of that. Lord, I, I apologize for my self-seeking, God, for being selfish. And Lord, I pray that you remove any confusion or any evil thing that's a, a result of that for my life and for my home. God, I pray that we would not be like an Aiken hiding things that belong to you or hiding things that don't belong to us, hiding secret sin, hiding uh, uh, these things that, that have no place in our homes, Lord. I pray that we would be a congregation full of different houses who are in one mind and one accord, who are walking in an upright fashion. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. That tried and true, I understand, that comes in the drought. I am tried in the storms. I am tried in the adversity. I am tried when things don't go my way. I am tried when I disagree. I am tried when, when it hurts. I am tried when there's pain. I am tried, God, when it do, I don't see a way out, Lord, but I understand I don't walk by, by, by uh, sight, Lord. I don't walk by sight. I don't. But God, we are a people of a faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. Help us to trust in you, Lord. I pray that we would be peacemakers and peacekeepers. Lord, I pray that we would, we would not be strangers to the drought. We would not be strangers to the storm. 
because we would go in there and establish peace. We would go in there and we would establish peace and we would keep it. I pray that you forgive us for getting ahead of ourselves, Lord, when we don't hear clearly from you and we make up the next step ourselves. And then we say things like, well, God will bless me either way. I pray that you forgive us for that, Lord. Lord, I pray that you, re- you highlight things in our lives that we might have added unto ourselves that you did not add. And now it's hindering us, Lord. It's being a hindrance to us, God. I pray that when we go to our brothers and our sisters to ask for forgiveness and repent and confess our sins to them, that they're receptive. Lord, I pray that they're receptive, God, that, that you would mold in and, and soften our hearts, Lord, that, that our hearts would be good soil. Our hearts would be good soil, Lord. There's a lot of junk to deal with, God, but you specialize in dealing with junk. You really do. You're a good God. You're a good God. I pray for every man and woman, boy and girl, Lord, that's in this place. I pray for a special anointing. I pray for a special anointing, Lord, that, that when all of this stuff is dealt with, they can walk in it. And that, that they, would, they would connect with their purpose and that they would identify who they are. That they would be secure in their identity because they're walking in their purpose. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And today, Father, as a body, we agree and we, we commit to walking by your word. And we ask for forgiveness for the times we have not. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name.